If you don't remember or hear anything else I say this morning, I want you to hear this following phrase. As you believe, so shall you do. As you believe, so shall you do. Your actions will reflect exactly what you believe. Some time back, there was a hurricane coming down into the Outer Banks, like, duh, like that never happens. And we see where one is headed toward the coast sometime this week, perhaps. Well, a local pastor went down to the sound up there, and that's where most of the damage is done, is to the houses on the sound. And there was an 80-some-year-old woman who lived alone, and her house was right on the water. Pastor went looking for her to see if she needed to get away from there because the hurricane was on the way. Went in the house and couldn't find her. And finally heard her voice out back. The pastor went around, and there was this old lady standing on a rock overlooking the sound with nobody else around and both of her hands raised and saying, I rebuke you, wind and water, in the name of Jesus, don't touch my house. That's how that prayer went. The pastor said, there's a hurricane coming. Do you need to come on inland with me and stay with me? And the lady said, I've been here for 80 years and the water has never touch my house. She said, because I have always asked God not to let it. That is an amazing testimony because she believed firmly that God would answer that prayer. The hurricanes was the giant that was in her life. And we're going to look at that in just a moment in 1 Samuel chapter 17 about giants. We all have one. Every single person in here has got a giant breathing down your neck. And I'm here to tell you that God is the giant killer. And we're going to look at an example of how a giant tried to belittle one of God's children and how that got dealt with. Verse number one, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah. They had invaded Israel. And they pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Ephesnamon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah. And they set the battle array against, in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side. And Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. I want you to picture that in your mind as to what that looked like. Thousands and thousands of soldiers. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Let me tell you this in modern English, he was nine foot six inches tall. Now, if he went along the scale of what the the Department of Health says you're supposed to weigh for that height. I'm actually supposed to be about six foot nine, I think, you know, according to mine. But he was supposed to weigh 575 pounds. That was if he was average. The biggest, the baddest, and the most evil of all of them comes out to challenge the armies of Israel. And let me tell you this, people, the devil will send his champion out to come after you too. If you are serving God, if you're on fire for God, if you're in his will and and you belong to him, the devil's champion is going to come for you too. And how you handle it is going to make all the difference in the world. It said he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000.
1,000 shekels of brass. Most scholars said his coat weighed 126 pounds. He had greaves of brass on his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. I'm going to tell you what that looked like in a minute. And the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. All that size and all that armor and yet he still got somebody carrying a shield in front of him. The spear according to a lot of archaeologists, was upwards of 26 feet long. And the spear he had weighed over 15 pounds. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight me with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And then this hateful, evil man said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. I want you to also understand not to be surprised when evil challenges you and tries to shut you down. And it'll come in any of a thousand forms. That you, you, you must understand that the devil is bold and he's arrogant and he's blasphemous. And he will mock your faith and he will blaspheme all that's holy. If you want to see what that looks like, just turn the TV on for about an hour. I don't care where you put it. You're going to see some of that. And so when Saul and all of Israel heard those, the words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. Oh, don't look down at them, boy. That's the average church member we're looking at right there. That's the truth. The average church member is horrified when Satan's champion rails out at them. They fold up like a jackknife. They go to bed. They won't come out of the house. They don't want to talk to nobody. They go into this deep, dark, whatever, because the devil is after me. Dr. Lakin used to say, if you don't want the devil to bother you, do nothing, say nothing, and have nothing. He'll leave you alone then. But you try to serve God, and the, he's going to yell, and he's going to holler, and he's going to scream to try to scare you. Don't be frightened by it. Don't buy it. The Philistine drew near morning and evening and he presented himself and he did this for 40 days. And back now at the ranch, Jesse said to David, his son, who was the youngest child, he was a teenage boy. We've been looking a lot at some of the teenage boys in the book of Daniel here of late. These weren't the little snowflakes that you see today that's running for a safe space with a coloring book. These were 14-year-old men that weren't afraid of anything. That's what we were looking at there. And here David was back watching the sheep. That was the junior man's job in the family. If you were the youngest and the littlest or whatever, they stuck you watching the sheep. That was, nobody wanted to do that. But he did a wonderful job. And so he said to his son, take now for your brethren a, a, an ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto their captain and see how your brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. There wasn't a whole lot of fighting going on. They were just there. David rose up early in the morning. And he left the sheep with a keeper. And he took and did as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. You know what they were really doing? There's a lot of names for what they, each army was doing. They were showboating. Ever heard that? Maybe you've heard the word profiling. What was it? Rick Flair used to say he's styling and profiling. That's about all they were doing. 
They weren't doing any fighting. They were trying to make a show. I've got this rooster at the house. Great big gray rooster. And sometimes when I go in the lot to put him up for the night, he can make the feathers stick out about that far on his neck to look like he weighs about 100 pounds. And he comes after me. Being the big, tough, strong man I am, I make sure I have a shovel to block myself with to get him in that chicken lot. But he, look, he, he makes a big noise and he comes at you and he looks fierce. That's all that they were doing. Some people said they were, used the expression, they were signifying. But they were doing nothing. They were kind of like the keyboard warriors on Facebook. They're going to do this to you and they're going to do that to you if you could ever get them out of their mama's basement. And so David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and he ran into the army and he came and saluted his brethren and as he talked with them, there came the champion again, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and he spoke according to the same words and David heard them. And the men of Israel, when they saw him, they fled for him and were so afraid. And, and, and the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has, come, uh, that has come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up? And it shall be that the man that kills him will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his house free in Israel. That means no taxes. Let me tell you something. If somebody promised I'd never have to pay taxes again, I'd go charge and right into it too with a butter knife. David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And he asked a question because he was indignant. He couldn't believe that nobody was going to go up there and take that devil out. He couldn't believe that because he had faith. He believed that he was in the army of God, not just the army of Israel. And he was just young enough and just stupid enough to have faith to believe that God was going to do what he said he could do. And that's what we got to do. We got to stop this human reasoning. We got to stop this plan B garbage that we live off of all the time. And we got to realize that we've got to be childlike enough to have faith to believe that God can do what God said he could do. And he asked the question, and you need to ask the question when the devil sends his champion. He said this, for just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He saw the man. He saw the nine foot, six inch, 575 pound man. He said, who is that? Who does he think he is? He is defying the armies of the living God. He wasn't looking at the man's size. He wasn't listening to the man's words. He wasn't even hearing any of the threats. He just got indignant and said, how dare he defy the armies of the living God? What an, an unbelievable faith. And the people answered him after this manner, so shall it be done to the man that kills him. And when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed him before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to King Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. I'll go and fight this Philistine. Teenage boy, out of all these trained soldiers and warriors that had been in the army for years, and here's some kid that all he does is tend sheep, and he said, I'll, I'll take him out. I'll fix it for you. How embarrassing that had to have been to Saul and the armies of Israel, their lack of faith and their lack of belief in God. And here's a young boy, he said, I'll, I'll do it. And Saul said to David, oh, I love this. You'll hear this too. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're just a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. That kind of talk will come from your family that means well. People that love you will say that. It'll come from your friends. It better not come from your church, but it might. And all the time, it'll come from your doctor. How many times have you <clears throat> been, you've heard from God that he wants you to do this, he wants you to be that, and you go, my doctor said. 
I'm sorry, but today's doctors have become so dumb that the commercial said, you got to go tell your doctor what kind of medicine to give you. I'm sorry, that's pitiful. I had a doctor one time in the emergency room. I went in there for kidney stones. And I couldn't even straighten up. And he said, well, what do you want me to give you? And I said, what do you mean, what do you want me to give you? I don't know what you have. You're the doctor. And so he gave me a list, and I picked the best ones I could think of. Give me, give me a couple of those. He wouldn't let me bring them home, though. But, I mean, come on. They're supposed to tell you what you need. But that's the way that the world works. They'll say, you're, you're not able. You're, you're just a this, you're just a that. You're, you're not qualified. You're not educated enough. You don't have this and you don't have that. And you, you can't do that. David said to Saul, <clears throat> thy servant <clears throat> kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him, and I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard, smote him, and killed him. Your servant killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living God. Wow. Wow. I'm going to take him out because he defied God. He defied the armies of the living God, so he's going to be just like that lion and that bear. <clears throat> Those that defy God and God's people will one day be brought down to nothing. Please understand that. Oh, they might be flying high now. <clears throat> they may think they have the upper hand now. But the Bible said that I sought for them and they were nowhere to be found one day. While you are serving God and while you are in his will and until it's time for you to go, I want you to understand this. You are indestructible. The devil does not have the power to take your life. The devil does not have the power to do a blessed thing until the Lord allows it. If you are following God and you're in his will, don't you sweat it. So David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul told David, go and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that was real profound, wasn't it? And so Saul, being the coward that he was, he armed David with his armor. Now Saul was a big man. He was over six feet tall. And David was a little kid. And he armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass on his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. Can you imagine putting all that big heavy stuff on that little kid to send him out after that giant? And so David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go for he had not proved it. And so David said to Saul, I can't go with these. For I have not proved them, and so David <clears throat> put them off of him. When you are going to try to tackle the devil's champion, the very first thing that is offered to you in the way of armor is human reasoning. Human reasoning, and human reasoning has never worked. When it comes to the things of God, there's a lot of you sitting in here this morning that if it was up to human reasoning, you'd be dead in hell, in the hospital, in, in jail, or wherever, but you surely wouldn't be in here if it was up to human reasoning. Every time you try to look at your circumstances, and then you look at what you want to do for God, you look at your circumstances, uh-uh, it's not going to work. You got to get your eyes off of human reasoning and the circumstances that you are currently in for if you are going to ever be anything for God it's got to be in the supernatural. It's got to be supernatural. And so he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. I've had a lot of people ask me why in the world did David get five stones? Why didn't he just get one? 
Because David figured Goliath might have four brothers waiting on him. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He got to look up to see him. And the Philistine came and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, that was the one that was coming to fight him that was chosen to fight him, said he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. He had rosy cheeks. Don't you hate that, guys, when you're little? He made fun of him. He laughed at that, That's That's what you got? That's what you're sending me? And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Let them curse you all they want by their gods because their gods are nothing. Don't ever be intimidated by that. Don't ever be intimidated at the threats and the ugly words and the things they say they're going to do to you and so forth. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I'll give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. He's going to try to talk him to death. And then David said to the Philistine, and listen to this, you ought to take this verse, underline it, copy it, put it on a piece of paper and carry it in your wallet, your purse, or whatever, because when the devil sends his champion, and he will, and he'll do it often, you can read this to him. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Whew. That's a mighty bold talk for a kid going up against a nine foot six inch man. But you know what? David believed. And as you believe, so shall you do. Your actions will show what you believe. Then he told him, he said, This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and take your head from you, and I'll give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. For one reason and one reason only he did this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You want people to believe in God? Then you show them there's a God. You show them. That's what you're here for. We are here to show the glory and the power of God. All my life I've had people tell me and some teachers tell me that all oh, miracles ain't for today anymore and that don't happen anymore and you can't do this anymore and this don't happen anymore and they were lying. Oh my goodness, do you realize what power you have as a child of God? The Holy Spirit living within you? And he made this one more statement. He said, in all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David. What did David do? Did he start backing up? You ever have anybody real big come up to you and you just start backing up? Or maybe something has happened in your life and you just start backing up? It said David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He was in a hurry to get it done, and he didn't waste time. He ran toward his enemy. Do not ever back up when the devil's champion comes and starts threatening you. Don't you back up. You just keep going forward. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and I like this, he slang it. He didn't sling it, he slang it. <laughs> And smote the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. All that talk, all that armor, all those shields and helmet of brass. And he had one little spot right there that was open and David put a rock right in it. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. 
and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So David ran, and he stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And guess what? When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they ran. When they saw that their champion was dead, they ran. The Bible says very plainly, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Don't be running from the devil. You resist him. You stand up and you stand your ground and you fight and you do it in the name of Jesus. And I'm here to tell you it doesn't make any difference what your circumstances is. It doesn't make any difference what's going on in your life. You do this and you will prevail. You will win in the name of Jesus. Don't ever back up from the devil. Don't do that. Don't let him buffalo you and cheat you out of your joy and your victory and the life that God has intended for you. You stand your ground. And don't ever be afraid no matter how big and bad the devil's champion is because God is the giant killer, folks. He is able, and he's waiting for you to call on him. I'm going to ask if everyone would stand. We're going to have a really unique song of invitation, and if you know it, I want you to sing along with June as she sings this song. I'm going to ask if some prayer warriors would come here and stand at the altar. Now, this is the way this is, folks. If you've got business with God, you come down here to this altar and pray. If you need one of these folks to pray with you, they will be glad to pray. If you've never been saved, you come and take them by the hand and say, I need to be saved. If you need to rededicate your life, if whatever it is that's on your heart, as they play this song right here, one of my very favorites, then you come on, let's do business with God this morning.